beta blockers like nabivalol and propanolol, although they only show a modest to negligible improvement in lifespan in mice, I believe there's a lot more nuance in humans. So let's dive into the mechanisms of action and discuss some dosing protocols. The best analogy I've heard is to compare the heart to a car engine. So rather than run it like a race car team where they're rebuilding it every few races, you really want to manage it like a Toyota Corolla owner that has the potential with that same engine to get a million miles. So it does need to be used, but not where you know your, your heart rate is above normal or you want your uh, blood pressure to be right at that sweet spot for longevity. So starting with Nabivalol, it's a third generation beta adrenergic receptor blocker and it has a high affinity for beta-1, unlike something like propanolol, which I'll come back to. So it translates into more EONNOS, and so that means uh, more better nitric oxide production, more vasodilation. There has been an ITP mice trial on nabivalol, and it didn't show to increase male or female lifespan, but there was a non-ITP one, and it was shown in males to have a very modest uh, increasement of 6.4%. And I believe this is down to, obviously, you know, it's, it's very multifaceted. So you've got, um, you know, the EONS, you know, better nitric oxide synthase. And then, uh, so you, that could translate into less inflammation, uh, less reactive oxygen species as well, as well as the, uh, the cardiac protecting properties. But as we'll get into, it's very person specific, the longevity benefits from beta blockers. So let's move on to propanolol. It's a beta one and beta two blocker, so non-selective. And, but it has the benefit of being lipophilic. It can cross the blood brain barrier. And then unfortunately there's no lifespan data on it in mice. And I don't think, like I say, because of the specificity, I don't think it would really, you'd see much anyway. But um, because there are some negative aspects, as I mentioned, being a beta two blocker, if you're doing that in the, the you want bronchial dilation for exercise because that could limit VO2 max. The same for the muscles too. If you're not getting vasodilation there, then that could limit VO2 max as well. As well as, um, you know, just your heart rate, the stroke volume and the actual range it can go into, that, that's the other drawback. So, and that gets me onto my dosing protocol with propanolol because I'm doing cardio three days a week. That allows me to do uh, four days like where I can do propanolol. I do it in the evening because I'm not doing cardio that next morning because it has around about six hour half-life. So effectively like 12 hours later, you've still got, it's just a residual amount left and then it could affect VO2 max. And I did an experiment where I cut out propanolol for 10 days to see if it improved my cardio output where I measure my caloric output uh, do it in a steady state environment, reading subtitles on the news for 20 minutes, and I didn't see any increasement in it. I think maybe, yeah, I could do a longer experiment and just see what happens there. Check out our 12 month rejuvenation program where every three months we look at 225 different biomarkers and get your future vitality optimized. There's even a six month break clause if your situation was to change. As highlighted earlier, having a low resting heart rate, I believe that's one of the most powerful indicators for longevity. So ideally 45 or even a bit lower still. And then of course, blood pressure too. So these are things I keep an eye on. And my systolic has crept up in the recent months where I think like having a big evening meal, a lot of protein to digest for the kidneys. And then that can, you know, also sodium clearance as well with a big meal. And so that can just put a little strain on the kidneys and then blood pressure can creep up. And for me, I've seen it at 115, occasionally at 118, I've seen that. And it reflects on my epigenetic systolic blood pressure score, which is giving a long-term trend of it. So there's definitely room for improvement there. To get it to say around 110, that kind of region, maybe it doesn't matter if it even dropped to 105 occasionally, but 110 is about the sweet spot. And for myself, I've got very good vasodilation. I take arginine as well as low dose Tadalafil just on my three cardio days a week. I'm also just starting at citrulline malate again for vasodilation as well as uh, urea clearance for my kidneys as well. And so that, that's why I can get away with doing propanolol. But if someone, if their blood pressure was a bit higher and they wanted to do like say nabivalol, that'd be a good option because you can do that seven days a week. I've seen good responses to it. So therefore it could suit someone doing beta blockers more for the cardio protective effect and say they don't want to be doing a whole litany of different things for 
uh, nitric oxide production, uh, or like you know, some people on TRT, even their blood pressure can go up marginally from you know like erythrocytosis, high hematocrit basically. Obviously, that's about trying to figure out the right dose, but then it's there's everyone's different. So propanol has HPA access suppression properties, so that can downstream of that uh, like lower cortisol. So if that's something you're weak with, if you've got high cortisol levels, systemic levels of it, then it could have some prolonged longevity aspects there and so by calming the sympathetic nervous system then that can translate into better heart rate variability and i've seen this with my own data my uh, recovery scores dig so far propanolol is giving me an improvement by two percent so not a huge amount but a little bit of improvement there at doing it four days a week and because of that anxiety reducing effect, it's a very widely prescribed drug here in the UK. I mean, I've spoken to people up doing even 80 milligrams of it. So I think my dose at 30 milligrams is very moderate. There's just so many lifestyle factors to take into account with beta blockers, if they're right for you and which type, because say, if you're trying to lose a lot of body fat, uh, beta blockade, that can reduce uh, lipolysis, you know, turning fat into energy, so it can affect hepatic gluconeogenesis signaling, and that translates into a greater reliance on glycogen early, and then that can reduce your workout, uh, your workload. But on the flip side, you could argue propanol is very much a double-edged sword, because say for myself example, I'm doing arginine and that PDE5 uh, inhibitor I mentioned earlier to Dalafil. So that could be, that's helping with the beta 2 blockade, which is uh, uh, stopping, uh, you know, peripheral blood flow, uh, perfusion to those muscles. And, but then what it's not doing, because you've got beta 1 blockade as well, and that's limiting uh, maximal heart rate and contractility. So it's not helping there. And so what I might do is try 30 days without propanolol, see what impacts I have on a long, over a longer period compared to 10 days previously. And maybe I'll have to do something for that chronic, uh, that sympathetic nervous, trying to uh, keep that suppressed in the meantime over that 30 day period. And if I do get an improvement, then I could switch to uh, nebivalol because it's got that beta-3 agonist property, so that can, downstream of it, help with you know, EONOS. And certainly during the winter time, that's a good time to cycle off propanolol. If you're someone, if you've got low body fat, your body generates not very much heat, then that can also be detrimental. I've seen my heart rate variability go down from excessive coldness during the winter, and so, that could be another factor because propanolol can make people cooler as well. You know, if you've just got that low resting heart rate, then everything's turning over a little bit slower. And during the night time, it can mean your body's a bit colder. And just to really emphasize, metabolic health is fundamental for health span. So outside of blood pressure, cholesterol health, managing those lipids, mine have been going in the right direction. And since this test, even HDL, that's gone up as well as managing blood sugar spikes a whole lot better now with a continuous glucose monitor and insulin resistance and uh, arterial plaque is just something that's happening over your whole lifetime so managing it is very important so if you're really trying to keep your resting heart rate down as well as uh, blood pressure then nabivalol might be a better option if you're very concerned about blockade to that beta 2 so that's more to the muscles rather as it's a selective being a beta one more lean towards that as well as being a beta three agonist so the downstream of that that can help with uh, EO and OS you know uh, nitric oxide production unfortunately Swiss chems are sold out of it so hopefully they're back in stock with it soon because I think it's not bad value at what $36 with a 10% discount code. So to summarize, I'm gonna continue experimenting with beta blockers, not only cutting out my propanolol for that longer period, but also trying a higher dose as well, see if that impacts my VO2 max. And then if it doesn't, then maybe I'll get my resting heart rate down lower, or I can switch on to nabivalol, put them head to head and see which one is best. So if you like that video, then check out this one on SGLT2 inhibitors. This diabetic drug, I believe, has the biggest potential out of all of them for longevity. Thanks for watching. See you next time.